Welcome to the 2013 Aloha Clinic training videos. This section is going to cover free kicks. Right after we finish free kicks, we're going to merge into scrimmage kicks, cover them both on this tape. So let's get started. Play number one is a starburst kick return formation, and that's when you get a group of guys circled here. They're going to come together and try to deceive the defense as to who has the ball. And we're not concerned about the guy on the left or the right or the back. We're really only concerned about the guy who's in front of the runner. Because if he comes out with it, it's going to be illegal forward handing. So in this case, number five. If anybody else gets it, we're going to be okay. And in this case, the runner did come out with the ball, the original guy that had it, so we have no problem. But I wanted to include this on here so that you'll know who we're looking for if we see a starburst on the field this year. Play number two, we're going to talk about the free kick line, and there's also a hold on this play. And you can see here it's clear that the free kick line was penetrated before the ball was kicked. And if you watch the near official, you can see him kind of leaning down the field, meaning he was moving before the kicking team was beyond him. And you need to stay there and make your ruling. Now, as we move downfield, this is what I talk about when it comes to keys. We have to really know where our key is because we've got four potential hot spots on this return. The umpire who was covering the hash and that area picked up block number two, which was a takedown hold. But based on your free kick mechanic, you need to take a look at this play and say, who's got group number one, where you probably also have a hold? Who's got two, three, and four? And this is a great video to discuss your free kick mechanic key responsibility. During the return, holding number 37 of the receiving team, K-9 penalty. First off. Play number three is another free kick line play. And the general rule of thumb is if it's not an onside kick, you want to have a foot down in order to call it. But in some cases, even if you don't have a foot down, you can call it. And I think this is one of those cases where it was called because pretty much his whole body's over the line because he's leaning so far forward that it is encroachment. It was called here, and I think correctly so. Field. Encroachment. On the kicking team, five yard penalty. The kick will be from the 35 yard line. Play number four, another free kick line play. And the reason why we have the philosophy to have a foot down or the entire torso over, even if you don't, is because if we call a foul for these that are just really so tight, where maybe this guy has his hand or knee airborne in the neutral zone, we have to shut it down. It takes a lot of time, and nobody really enjoys that. NCAA, this is a live ball foul if you call it so you can enforce it from the end. It doesn't disrupt anything. But in the National Federation, it does. And if you can let it go, let it go. If you can't, if you've got a foot down or if you've got the, the body so far over the line that you have to call it, then by all means call it. But have a philosophy in place that allows you to avoid some of the ones that are just real tight. Play number five, we're going to talk about a corner block. And the corner block or spring block is the block on the edge during a return that allows the return man to get around the corner. In this case, here it is. That is a key block and we have to have our mechanics established, our lanes in place, so that we know who's going to be watching that guy on the corner. Because there is a hold there. You can see there's a flag thrown in for it and it was properly called. So look over your mechanics, find who's responsible for your corner blocks, and make sure they have eyes on this because he grabs them, twists them, pulls them, turns them around. Doesn't take them down, but this is a hold, and it does spring number five for more yards. It was a good get by this crew. We're going to stick with our theme in play number six as far as sticking with your keys and staying in your lanes. Unless nothing's going on, then you can check down to the next lane. Now in this play, we've got an illegal low block away from the action. So unless you're the official who's responsible for the offside action, we're not going to get this. So in this particular case, if we focus in on the players that I circled here and the direction of the circle, that's the official that has to stick with this area. Even though the ball carrier's not here, there's too much action going on. If you stick with it, it will present itself. And you can pick up this key low block, which is a very dangerous injury potential block, just by sticking with your key. Play number seven, we're going to move into onside kicks. And we already talked about free kick lines, but the standard is tighter 
on any type of onside or specialty kick. So in this case, we've got an onside kick. You can see there's a lot of action going on. Kicking team recovers the ball. No flags on the play. Ball goes 10, it's touched. Everything else looks pretty good. But when you go back and look at this, that is encroachment. In fact, even though he doesn't have a foot down over, that's encroachment because his entire body is over the line, even on a regular kick. So let's try to pick these up, especially on the onsides. Let's move into an onside kick, and this is we're going to talk about that blocking rule. Who initiates the block, when you're allowed to block, and in this case you can see there is a block right around the 9-yard mark from the kick. We've got a flag down for an illegal block against the kicking team. But watch this receiving team player go at him. He initiates the block. He's not going for the ball. So this is not a foul on the kicking team because the kicking team did not initiate that act. And once the receiving team initiates the act, any kicking team player can then block. Play number nine. I only put this in here because the free kick hit the pylon. I've never seen it before. The official was there, backing away from it. Sees it hits the pylon, immediately rules touchback. Then he goes and fixes the equipment, does his job. Just thought it was a cool play. All right, let's move into scrimmage kicks. Play number 10, which is the first in the scrimmage kicks, is roughing the snapper. And we just don't see this very often, so I've got the guy highlighted. Ball snapped, blows him up. Correctly called. Because we don't see it very often, I was very happy to get this video so that we can take a look at it, remind everybody that that center has to have an opportunity to be able to protect himself after he snaps the ball. Play number 11, we had running into the kicker called, and this is a correct call, and I think it'll be pretty clear for you to see that. The defense jumps up, he's airborne, contact is unavoidable, but when he hits him, he doesn't follow through with anything high, no elbows, he just comes down on the guy, and just because the punter falls does not make it roughing, he tries to hold him up. This is a great call for running into. Play number 12 is roughing the kicker. We missed this one, but it's important to remember that the plant leg is critical. If the plant leg is hit with any force applied, it's roughing. And in this case, when we go back and watch the, the replay of it from the end zone, you'll see a little hyperextension of this knee as he comes down right there. That's enough for roughing the kicker, and we need to protect the players in these instances. So we need to try to adjust our angle however we need to adjust it to see that leg. Play number 13, roughing the kicker was called. I think anybody in the world could have made this call. It's not only roughing the kicker, I guess it's kind of a chop. But uh, roughing the kicker was called. A good get, gotta get, and uh, correct call. Personal foul, roughing the kicker, defense, 15 yard penalty from the previous spot, automatic first down. Play number 14 is every now and then we're gonna get fooled. Could be acting, could be the flop, whatever you want to call it. But this guy was not contacted and he drew the flag because he flopped. So be careful. Get yourself into a position where you can see the contact. Don't guess. But this guy just flies right by him. The guy just acts like he got swept. Good acting job. You got to hand it to him. Great just a brief. Oh, nice acting. We got to get the Academy Award out, guys. It looks like a number. Play number 15 is a field goal in which the receiving team player is blocked into the kicker. And in the high school book, if you're blocked into the kicker, if that results in the contact on the kicker, there is no foul for running into or roughing. And in this case, it's very clear that that was the case. Now, the referee may be able to pick this up and probably, probably should have. But if he's unable to because he's focused on a bobbled snap or something else going on with the kicker, then the line official on that opposite side has a real good look at that and should help the referee. Somebody's got to pull him off of that call. Play 16 and 17 are plays where the punter gets his knee down accidentally because of a low snap or some other reason. And then the play is dead, and that's the way the rule's written, and good job to the referees. But let me tell you, this would be a great rule change to give the punter the same exception that a holder would have on a kicking down. Play 17, here's another example. It, this play is just so huge, it changes everything about field position and possibly the game. 
So instead of the receiving team having the ball back 30, 40 yards, now they've got the ball on the nine-yard line. And that's not a game changer. I don't know what is. But it was a good job. Both of these were picked up and ruled down. Play number 18 is a punt, and the official calls the receiver for an invalid fair catch signal. And we don't see that called very often because most of us give them quite a bit of leeway for the Dion sweep or, or maybe not doing the full function as described in the rule book. But you can see this guy is so lazy, and this is slowed down about his signal, that that's a great call. Invalid fair catch signal, return team, five yard penalty, first down. Play number 19, we're just going to cover mechanics for punts inside the 50. Some people use the 55, which is obviously the opposite 45. But most of us use punts inside the 50. And if you have a punt inside the 50, or any time a receiver lines up at the 10, then the back judge should probably get to the goal line and stay there. You don't want to be backing off. You want to get a real good view at that so you can see exactly where it's batted. Call right, but we need to get that mechanic just a little bit more refined. Same thing in play number 20, but he goes the other way. In this case, we're inside the 50, so the back judge should be on the goal line. And as he's there waiting, he should stay on the goal line. Don't come up during that loose ball action because the only thing that is really critical is a ruling relating to the goal line during that loose ball. If it penetrates the plane, touchback. If it doesn't, live in the field of play and whoever recovers gets it. So stay on that goal line and be in a good position to get that call right. Play number 21 is an example of kick-catch interference without contact. And we're also going to start uh, discussions on the rule change which adds an enforcement of 15 yards at the spot of the fair catch interference instead of just an awarded fair catch you go from that spot and then you have 15 yards that you can tack on so here's your spot of interference that's your spot of enforcement for what used to only be an awarded fair catch but now is awarded uh, fair catch with the 15 yards not where he is tackled. So you have to have an enforcement spot down. So your flag should be a spot flag. Play number 22. There's kick catch interference. There's a fair catch signal. And somehow we allowed the muffed ball to be picked up by the person who gave the fair catch signal and advanced. The only way this can happen is if the back judge misses the signal. So I understand as a back judge that you want to take a peek at the kicker and get a feel for where the kick's going and how high and what direction, but that peak has to be very short. It has to be shorter than the length of time it takes to make a fair catch signal because if you, may, if you miss that fair catch signal, you could be in a world of hurt and this could be you on that play. So pay attention to the returner first and foremost. If you lose track of the ball, he will take you to the ball, but first and foremost, from the time of that kick until uh, it comes down. You need to know whether or not he gives a signal. Play number 23 is a block in the back at the point of attack. So look at where the guy's catching the punt or fielding the punt. And that's normally where you're going to see these block in the backs. I've got the guy highlighted. This one is as clear as day. So as he comes down, he just blows through the guy's back. Point of attack springs the returner. Pretty good return. We got a flag down for a block in the back. Great call. Not sure why it didn't come from the official in that position, but at least it was picked up, so that's a nice job. Play number 24, a block in the back was called incorrectly, which is why it's so important that we pay attention to the entire act. Don't come in on this late, particularly if you're following it from behind. So we've got the runner in perspective to the guy who's the potential tackler and the blocker. You can see that that is clearly a side block. But it was called a block in the back. The other thing I want to look at on this play is how this tackle is made. You see number 41 blue coming in. And when he comes in, he hits at the shoulder level, launches up. There's helmet to helmet contact. That should be a foul for illegal helmet contact. He needs to lower his target area. Now in NCAA this year, this guy is gone for the game. And if you feel it's flagrant in high school, then he should be disqualified. 
Play number 25 is a punt that results in a touchback because it goes over the goal line. But there's a lot happening on this play, including some interaction between a guy giving a fair catch signal and the kicking team. But he left him enough space, so that's not interference. And you see that little push in the back? Because he has a right to either down or recover that ball, he can't advance it because it's still a kick. As long as it's in the field of play, though, he can recover it, and he has a right to recover it. So that push in the back is not considered a block in the back. It's considered an attempt to get to the ball, and it's legal. Play number 26 is another play that results in a touchback as a result of a kick crossing the goal line. Now, this is one of those rule differences between college and federation. In college, because that ball was touched in the field of play by the receivers, it survives the end zone. So it's not dead until it leaves the end line. In high school, the touching only matters in the field of play because once it crosses the goal line plane or touches the goal line plane, the ball is dead. The reason I say it only matters in the field of play is because the kicking team can recover it in the field of play and then the ball would belong to them. Otherwise, once it hits the goal line, it's a touchback. Play number 27, the deepest receiver in a punt return formation, throws a block on a kicking team player. Now, sometimes this is legal and sometimes it's not. You can see the block there. If he gives a fair catch signal, that's an illegal block and it's a 15-yard PSK foul. If he has not given a fair catch signal, was as the case here, there is no foul and it's a clean block.